Hi there. Today we are discussing the paper Disentangled Graph Convolutional Networks, which is a paper by Jiangxin Ma, Peng Kui, Kun Kuang, Xin Wang, and Weng Wu Zhu. And this is a graph neural network type of paper, and it solves an important problem. And that is that current methods until this paper from 2019 were learning node embeddings that were not disentangled. But let's take a step back and start with the basics of what is a graph neural networks. And in a graph neural networks, as the name suggests, you have a graph. So there are nodes and there are edges. Think of it as a social network. And we are going to use this social network analogy throughout our paper review. So this is, for example, Andre, that's me, that's, for example, J, and that's, for example, N. These are two numbers. And let's also take, um, uh, you know, your dad, your mom. Let's put uh, another one, um, uh, for example, M. And notice that he... Oh, I forgot to put this one. Um, and this is me. Now, in this circle, this is, for example, family. And in this circle, there is, for example, friends. The key point is that there are nodes, which in this case represents people, and there are edges between them, which represents relationships. For example, who knows who? For example, my mom and my dad know each other, but my mom does know does not know, um, for example, Jacob. So this is me and I am connected with different people and these people can be connected or not with themselves. The key point is that this group of people uh, represent different characteristics of myself. And because I spend much time with them, I naturally copy some of these characteristics. So, for example, if all these people here are doing, for example, machine learning, and I'm connecting with them, it's highly likely that I am also doing machine learning. If my mom and my dad would be both, for example, doctors, there would be a high chance that I would be at minimum interested in health care. So from the neighborhood of a node, in this case from the friends, one can infer certain aspects with respect to myself. For example, that I like machine learning and that I might like uh, healthcare. Now, in graph neural networks, the input is such a graph uh, with nodes and with edges. And the output is typically... So you take this thing as an input and then you get for each node, we are doing a node classification tasks. For each node, you will learn an embedding that is a vector representation of a word. For example, 64 uh, uh, in length. It's similar to a word embedding. And from this node embedding, we can do a node classification task. That is, for example, is Andre interested in um, machine learning or not? The truth is, and we get to the core of this method, the truth is just by looking at, you know, me, you can't know whether I'm interested in machine learning or not. But by looking also at my friends, you can infer that. Say you are on Facebook, say I never post about machine learning, but all my friends post about machine learning, then you can infer from my friends that I also like machine learning. So we get to the point of inferring something about a node from its neighborhood. But the point of this paper is that you want to infer different aspects from different parts of the neighborhood. So from my friends, I will infer my interest in machine learning or not. And from my parents, I could infer, for example, my interest in healthcare or not. By the way, my parents are not doctors. And all the methods so far, they were learning a global representation. That is, one would not know exactly what 
each of these um, you know, elements actually mean. And this paper come up with the idea, hey, we need to define a set of K you know, factors or K concepts. These are K things that are representative for a person. So for example, this is going to be K1, this is going to be K2, K3, and for the purpose of illustration, I will delete this. So this paper suggests that, hey, what about we, conti we continue to learn a representation, but in this representation, we, we purposely make it in such a way that certain parts, certain elements of this word embedding, of this node embedding are related to certain aspects from the neighborhood. So for example, say that this represents my interest in ML. It is highly likely, I mean, it's obvious that this node embedding with machine learning should be created only from my friends in machine learning. Like, Say that this thing wants to say my interests, my interest in, for example, natural language processing, not my general interest in machine learning, but my interest in natural language processing. Now, in order to know my interest in natural language processing, you need to look at my profile, but assume that I have never posted that, you, you need to look at the friends who are doing machine learning, infer what type of machine learning they are doing, and if they do NLP, then highly likely I also do NLP. But also, to infer my NLP interests, there is no point in looking whether my family is interested in NLP or not, because they are not interested in machine learning as a whole. So, the this parts of my relationship is not relevant for telling a certain aspect about my interest in machine learning or not. So we, we get the whole idea that we want to learn a representation that is composed of different representations, representation my, for my, for example, for my machine learning interest, for my healthcare interest, for my cars interest. And each of these interests come, comes only from processing a certain part of the neighborhood of a node. Not all of it, but only a certain part of it. And this paper proposes, firstly, this idea of creating this uh, you know, combined embedding, but also they propose a nice algorithm for learning this embedding. Let's look at this image because it uh, provides much of the intuition. Then we will look at the actual formulas and the actual algorithm to learn this. Then we will glance over some experiments. But if you like this video and you find it useful so far, don't uh, be shy to hit the like button. And why not even subscribe for more? This is the vector that we discussed. This is myself and this is these are my friends. Now each of this each of my friends contain a node uh, features. For example, age, uh, occupation, of uh, their posts on the news feed things of that nature. And this is the input. The algorithm is not included so far. Then we get into a neighborhood routing. Essentially, we want to infer from, from every node, from this one is our focus of attention now. We want to infer for each of the K concepts, we don't manually define these K concepts. We just define the number K and the algorithm is going to learn what are these K you know, representative con concepts for the whole graph. For example, if you have a social network, the K should be quite big as there are many aspects. But if you have only, um, uh, let's say, a company-wide net social network, then many fewer things should be interesting because nobody, nobody posts about their pets or their you know, cars or those aspects.
in their um, uh, company-wide profile. The point being, you define K, the number of such concepts, such as interest in machine learning, interest in cars, and we are going to infer, I mean, automatically, the algorithm will find out what are those five concepts and what part of the neighborhood of a node is representative from those for each of these concepts. So this could be, let's say, concept one, this could be concept two, and this could be representative for concept three. And then the algorithm is going to take this neighborhood, combine it in a way, consider you take the mean average or something, doesn't matter. And based on this, you are going to update uh, the node of interest. So in here, we are going to sort of extract my interest in machine learning, say it, um, data efficient machine learning, and we are going to update my information uh, with that. How do you do that? So we look at the node, we look at the, the neighbors, meaning the nodes that are directly connected with our node, and this neighborhood is split. This is an automatic process. You don't need labels to split the neighborhood, but for the purpose of illustration, consider it that it's split like that. And then for each such channel, so channels are the K concepts that we discussed. There is a learnable parameter W for each one. And we will get this node features. We will multiply by W1 to get to this smaller, you know, smaller embeddings. And this represents the embedding of a node V1 only with respect to the concept K1. This is the embedding with respect to concept K2, and this is the embedding with respect to concept K3. So each of these channels is looking at different aspects of that node. And this is very similar, meaning it's identical to a linear layer uh, in a neural network, because we are going to uh, see. So what we do is as follows. For a node i, we want to learn each of these k parts of the embedding that we will learn. So for a node u, we input these uh, features. For example, this is your age, your sex, your uh, education, things of that nature, your interests. And with this algorithm, we are going to get an output embedding. This output embedding is composed of k smaller pieces that we have discussed k of them. Each of these is a vector in itself of this size. Now, what we do is that we want to learn to identify for each node i something with respect to that concept. This is a vector. So you want a node, a node embedding representing a specific concept. So what you do is as follows. You pick the feature of vector i, so this is the feature vector, you multiply it by this matrix that is specific to concept k, and then you add a bias and you pass it through a nonlinearity. If this doesn't look familiar, this is literally a single layer. Because what when you have a single layer, I mean, it's a single layer with multiple neurons. This is what the single layer does. You take an input representation, xi, you multiply it by a matrix, you add a bias, and then you output a smaller representation. And you pass it through a non-linearity like ReLU. So this is literally a linear layer. Now, and, and this smaller part is just a normalization. So you, this is the uh, length of the vector. So this ensures that this vector has length one. They do it for uh, stability uh, when you process the gradients and the updates. So that's the main reason, but also um, it uh, makes intuitive sense. We are going to see why the answer is because you can, the dot products are cosine similarities rather than uh, just dot products. So this Zi is going to represent something, again, 
about the concepts k for node i. You pass it through a linear layer. And after you pass it through a linear layer, you got it, we do this thing, you convolute it, think of it, you get the average, but it's a convolution operation. Then you get to multiple embeddings and concatenate them to get the output, meaning the actual, call it disentangled representation for a particular node. This ZIs that we discuss are exactly those smaller things that um, were learned. And this is an iterative algorithm. Like this is not happening one time because you want to learn this V1. So this is a iterative algorithm. You run this thing about five times in their experiments. Um, and this is outside of the general training level. Now, let's look at a few things um, before uh, we look at the experiments. Okay, the question is how do you learn this W's? Like how do you learn that? And here in this image, we see that the neighborhood is split into different smaller neighborhoods. How does that happen? Um, the answer is it's automatic, but how? Let's see. They start with two hypotheses on which the core method is based. So hypothesis one, a factor K is likely to be the reason why a node U connects to a certain subset, so to multiple other neighbors, if the subset is large and the neighbors are similar with respect to, to aspect K. What does that mean? Here, if all these people are interested in machine learning and I'm connected to all of them, highly likely I'm interested in machine learning as well. It makes sense, right? If you study computer science, then it's highly likely that many of your friends are going to be in the computer science world. So obviously that um, is going to tell something about your interest in computer science. And the second hypothesis is that factor k is likely to be the reason why node u and node v are connected. Notice that now we talk about an individual connection between two nodes rather than from a node to a subset. If they are similar with respect to aspect k. I mean, obviously, if I am interested and if you are interested in, N in NLP and we know of each other, then we are highly likely connected in a way. And the algorithm uses those two hypotheses interchangeably, and it is an iterative algorithm. If you are familiar with uh, like mixture models, such as Gaussian mixture model, where you are going to do clustering in an iterative fashion, this algorithm, they are going to make a theoretical analysis that it, it is in itself um, iterative algorithm for making a mixture model. I'm not going to go over this analysis, but I will explain you how the algorithm works and why does it work that way. Right. So this is the algorithm and let's look of how this looks like. So in the first iteration, I, okay, I'm going to use only one concept. Let, let's actually use two concepts. We have W1 and W2. Um, let's use different colors. Okay, so now you multiply, we compute these embeddings and assume that this is your node. So this is me, Andre, and uh, these are some of my neighbors. Again, this is in the Z, that Z space. So this is Z, Andre, with respect to concept one, this is Z Jacob with respect to course to uh, you know concept one, Z Nicola with respect to concept one and so on. And question for you: This is the space of the Z. How large is the embedding for one of these? Right, it's two because it's two dimensional. Okay. And we look into this thing and imagine, just for illustration purpose, imagine that if we are close in this space, then um, we are similar in that respect. So for example, 
he is interested in you know, NLP and he is interested in NLP. If my embedding in this space is close to their embeddings in this space, then I'm also interested in NLP. So imagine now that I am looking for my general interest in NLP, looking only at myself, at my profile, you can't infer that. But looking also at my friends, you can infer that. So this is a clustering problem in which we want to look at the centroid. We essentially want to find the centroid of this whole graph of only me and my neighbors of what is the representative embedding, let's call it ZAI. So these are the initial ones at iteration zero. And I want, for example, my final embedding that is going to be a, not the mean, but it's going to represent the centroid of this cluster. So imagine that for illustration purposes, I will stick to the example of Gaussian mixture because it's familiar to many people. Imagine that you have a Gaussian mixture model around here. So these are uh, contour uh, maps where um, uh, higher, you know, the center of the Gaussian mixture is in this point. And through the iterative algorithm, we are going to move the center. Uh, a few times until we get to this thing. So we are going to start to the center being here, meaning at myself, and we are going to iteratively move the center until it reaches the point. And this, the center, this is going to be called C of K with respect to T. So we update only this center, not the direct embeddings for each node at, in this routing mechanism. So notice that it's, it's C, K with respect to time T. That means for a specific node U, which is not put here, but it is, you know, you know that it is. So for a node, you find the centroid of the cluster of the neighbor's embeddings at time iteration T. How do you do that? We are going to make a probabilistic model. And I want to break an assumption that you have now. So from this image, you might remember that the like it looks like hard assignments in the neighborhoods, right? It looks like this all these people are fully representative for my machine learning interests. This is nice for illustration, but it's not how the algorithm works. It's probabilistic in the sense that from each, from every single one, you will learn something about my interest in machine learning. Like, for example, my parents are not interested in machine learning, but they might be, you know, 1% interested because they read something from the newspapers. And that means that, you know, if they heard, if they were 1% interested, and when I was young, they heard, oh, social networks is going to be the next thing. They, you know, there is a small chance that they told me, hey, go into social networks. So I would be a bit interesting to social networks because they told me that. So there is also probabilistic uh, way of looking at things. And this is what they do. So they are defining this PK, which is the probability that a factor is the reason why a node U reaches a neighbor V. So now we talk about given two nodes we want to infer what is the reason why these two nodes are connected, right? Why am I connected to my parents? And each of these K is an aspect for I'm connected with them because we are in the same family for each node. So notice that on an edge that is going, so this is my node V and this is my node U. On an edge, you are going to have, you know, um, multiple probabilities because we are looking at this edge from different aspects from k aspects so pk is the probability that the factor k is the reason which should satisfy that um, for an edge right this p represents an actual probability like 
I am connected with my parents because 95% family, 2% I know football interest and 3% uh, location for example. Right. And you initialize this VK, this is nothing more than a soft max um, across things. And this one is, so this is node V and U, and it, this is the dot product between them. Forget this, it's not important. So you look into the dot product between them. So this is the interests meaning the information that two nodes contain with respect to machine learning interest. So if both, if you can infer just looking at our profile that we are both interested in machine learning, then it's likely that we are connected and machine learning is the reason why we are connected. So you create this dot products between this node and every single one of its neighbors and then you put some initial probabilities and then you use an uh, iterative algorithm so this is the centroid and the centroid for fast initialization it starts from your embedding so this is from your embedding the centroids are with respect to, to the k concept and then you make a probab you make you know a linear combination of these probabilities times the neighbors v for all of them at iteration t minus one. Again, this thing is just for normalization purposes to um, have length one. So the point here is as follows. Let's ask ourselves how many of these c's we are going to have. And the answer it is the number of nodes times the number of k. Because for each node, you are going to have um, k such clusters. So for one of these pairs of a node and a cluster concept, you initialize it at the your embeddings and then you add a linear combination of the neighbors. So my interest in machine learning is going now to be, meaning this embedding, it's starting from my direct interest in machine learning and the interest in machine learning of my neighbors and after you do this then you update the probabilities and this is nothing more than a dot product between the you know interest in machine learning of node v and the general interest in machine learning to my node because the ck the centroid of the cluster this is going to represent the embedding, which is going to represent my interest in machine learning. And this is the algorithm. Um, let's walk a bit again through it to make sure that you've understand it. Again, if you like this video, hit that like button. And um, yeah, so we perform a few iterations. Uh, in this uh, layer, we have k channels, and this is outside of the general training loop. So there are two loops. One is the training loop, and another one is this loop of the conv layer. So we start with the feature vectors and the neighbors. We output uh, the new embeddings. As a parameters, we saw that we have a linear layer for every single one of the key concepts, and we do as follows. You take every node, you take all the concepts, and you learn a representation of how much can a node individually tell, how much information can you extract about my interest in machine learning from my node only. You pass it through a linear layer. Then you initialize these clusters, um, right? And then you run five times, you take every single node. That is neighbor. And you do as follows. You compute the probability of how important, meaning, no, you compute the probability of how much this concept machine learning interest is relevant for the connection with a specific v right 
and then you softmax over this to make a probability. And then you take the channels and you update those clusters. And at the end, you compute the um, yu, which is the concatenation of those um, channels. Now, notice something that this thing is per node, right? So this thing, it is per node because the input is only one node and the output is only one node. So in the general pipeline, you would have as follows. You will have the train loop. You will have the node loop and you will have this routing loop uh, that we learned that and the important thing is that these parameters as are shared across all nodes so it's not one thing for a specific node like they are shared uh, across all nodes and you are going to learn something great Let's look at the experiments. They, they focus mostly on node classification tasks. And this is a semi-supervised classification task. That means that not all nodes have the final label. But uh, even so, you can, if, uh, uh, if two nodes are connected, right? Um, if my dad is a doctor, then you have a chance of knowing something about it. So even though you don't have the label that is doctor from its interest, you can infer something. And this is this work. Notice that it improves with about 1% you know, over uh, a method that is commonly used as maybe state of the art, but it's very commonly used, GAT. Um, and this was a breakthrough because before that, this was the you know common method and it got a plus one. So this method, it gets another plus one percentage. This um, is a multi-label classification task. And this is a macro F1 and micro F1. Um, this is mostly representative for um, very imbalanced data scenarios. And notice that this work constantly outperforms things and it does that with about 10 to 20 percent relative improvement so it's a relative improvement not absolute improvement the interesting point to notice is that the more nodes you have labeled right, the bigger the gains but notice that the gains are relatively constant, meaning this method is essentially state of the art. Like you, you use it and you are having high chances of beating all the other methods by default. Right. And um, this is a synthetic graph experiment in which they show super high improvements, like 17% improvements. But I would take this with a grain of salt because it's a synthetic graph. Um, uh, in real world task, you know, it gets like plus 1%. Also know that these data sets are quite saturated, meaning everybody tests on them. So people start to get to the maximum performance on them. But the point from this is this diagram. And this shows the absolute values of the correlation between the elements in the embedding. So these are the embeddings, it's size 64. And this is the absolute value of the correlations. Notice that the graph convolution networks, which was you know, state of the art in 2017, 18, a higher color, a more intense color means that the correlation is higher. And you don't want that. The question is why? Because if you learn an embedding, you want zero correlation. Essentially, you want a mutual information between the two elements of the embeddings. Why? Because if they contain mutual information, they tell you more information. It's like saying, hey, tomorrow it's going to be a cloudy day and tomorrow is going to be raining. 
if I already told you that it's going to be raining, you can obviously infer something about if it's cloudy or not. So my cloudiness information is essentially redundant. I lost some, I lost time and energy telling you about the cloudiness, where I could have told you, hey, tomorrow is raining, and um, it's going to finish at 2 p.m. You see, this is more information. And in this method, each of this represents a channel. And notice that outside of the channels, right, the two channels are not connect are not correlated. So each channel essentially looks at a specific aspect that is different from what the other channels look at. So each channel encodes a different information. Essentially, think of if you think of a channel as a vector, this vector space is essentially orthogonal. It, it looks like that. You don't learn some basis vectors that look not perpendicular because the most information is going to be extract from a perpendicular space. So in this and GCN, the eight channels capture mutually exclusive information. And this is great because there are fewer correlations. You get more robustness because everything looks at other things. Ideally, you would get also interpretability because you would look, hey, this channel actually looks at the family aspect. That's not yet the case with this work. So even though they, you know, maybe wanted to go in the direction of interpretability because this entangled is highly present in the interpretability literature, they don't actually go in that direction, meaning they don't make any assessments with regarding to the interpretability. And I would say it would be interesting to look at what are those you know, channels actually learning, because there is significant work from 2012, 13, 14, that looked to understand how convolution neural networks work, and they were you know, coming up with nice visualizations of what each neurons learned. It's not the case for this work, but that's, you know, uh, place for future work. And that's everything that I had to say. Thank you so much for watching and sticking to it. I hope you liked this um, paper, and if you did so, subscribe to for more. See you in the next one.